good evening. A lucky few of you know me very well. Some of you only know my, me by reputation, and the rest of you may not know me at all. My name is Mr. Mandel. I'm here to introduce you to tonight's Hilly Chase speaker, my father, Bobby. The reason we decided to invite him to speak tonight is because his own history has been so focused on leadership that he could help you understand a few concepts to think about in your day-to-day -day lives to prepare you for growing up and thinking of yourselves as a leader in whatever group you want to play a decision-making role within. Bobby started his professional career as a lawyer, graduating with a law degree from the University of Florida, home of the Florida Gators. He began his career with the Wotitsky Law Firm, a two-man operation, and as a managing director, helped build it into the largest law firm representing the local government of Charlotte County, Florida. He returned home to Orlando, Florida, where he started as a field laborer, using a hammer and driving trucks for his father's real estate development company, Greater Construction. Under his efforts, Greater Construction, which was deeply in debt, managed to innovate new practices to bring it back into the black, which means healthy and profitable, selling 14,000 homes in Central Florida, as well as managing and operating a utility company that provided water and sewage services to 35,000 people. While working at Greater, he was also a member of several Central Florida commissions, making decisions that ultimately improved the quality of life in Central Florida. For example, on the Blue Ribbon Commission on Education, he helped create educational policy to improve the public education standards at the time to try and re revitalize the public education system into something that could meet the new needs of the Central Florida community. He was also a member of the Expressway Commission, where after doing research and outreach, he brought the E-Pass to Central Florida before many other states knew what that was. Finally, he was also the first Jewish member of a local leadership club that, at the time, had no members of non-Christian faith and non-white heritage. After selling greater construction to a multinational real estate company, he got involved in politics, where after meeting the major contenders in the election of 2008, he decided that a completely unknown politician at the time of their meeting, Barack Obama, would make a powerfully productive impact on the American government and send an even more powerful message to the world about American culture. Within a few years after the election, he was afforded an opportunity to become an American ambassador, living abroad in the country of Luxembourg, where he was tasked with negotiating policies with the wealthiest nation, banking nation in the world. During his time as an ambassador, he worked with intelligence officials and economic advisors to best articulate the needs and expectations of the American government to his Luxembourgian peers. He was also inducted into the Order of the Oak Crown by the King of Luxembourg for outstanding service in diplomacy, the equivalence of being knighted in other countries. In addition to his political work, he took it upon himself to participate with the local orphanage, bringing 27 young orphans into his residence each month to paint and even go on trips to Disney World Europe. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Bobby. What happened to the hug? Thank you, Brad. This kind of brings me back seven years, because I was here 27 years ago when Zach was a seventh and eighth grade student here. Eighth and ninth grade? Seventh and eighth grade. Wonderful. Um, and as we were driving in today, when we drove through that one bridge, which was one single lane, and it just kind of all coalesced, and I, went, I thought to myself, wow, time sure has gone fast. And, and Zachary certainly has grown to the guy just like you guys are. To professor, a teacher here uh, at Eagle Brook, and I'm so proud of that. You've just done a wonderful job. So, um, I, we're going to talk today about leadership, um, and I want you to know that leadership just doesn't happen. It doesn't. It doesn't just become you because somebody says, "Oh, you're going to be the leader." Leadership happens with really hard work. To give you an example of that, when I first stopped practicing law where I was a senior partner in a major law firm driving a Porsche.
and I went to work for my dad, who was very interested in me becoming part of the organization that he ran, uh, the home building business. I was in the field as a laborer for 14 months. And what a laborer does is I showed up every morning at 6 o'clock, and I generally started the fire if it was cold in the morning. We were in Orlando. Um, and I drove, uh, instead of a Porsche, I drove a 1978 Dodge pickup truck with three on the collar. And I didn't even know how to drive it. So you probably don't even know what a stick shift truck is, but it was a stick shift truck, which I never knew how to drive. And didn't have a radio, because my dad said that the work that we were doing was entertainment enough, and they didn't have an air conditioner, because he knew that if it had an air conditioner, I'd be in the truck more than I'd be in the field. So I spent the first 14 months of my career as a person who worked in a construction company, in a home building company, as the guy who was the lowest guy on the totem pole. And not, virtually not everyone, some, most people didn't know that I was the boss's son. Most people just thought I was Bobby. I had a shirt that had Bobby on one side and greater construction, greater homes on the other side, so I knew who I was and where I worked every day. And that was the most important thing I could know because anything else was irrelevant. Anything else made me somebody who I really wasn't. So I had to earn becoming the president of that company and becoming the CEO of the company. Um, and it required me to understand leadership. And so today, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is my concept of leadership. So in order to achieve success, leadership requires a lot of different things, which we'll, which we'll talk about. But, but the first thing we're going to talk about is the word lead. It requires listening, empathy, authenticity, and determination. And listening is the ability to stop thinking about yourself and start hearing what other people are saying. Watch this quick video. Use active listening. During a conversation, especially a heated one, most people formulate the response before the other person even finishes their statement. This form of communication is more verbal combat than an exchange of ideas or opinions. Avoid this reflex by slowing down. Rather than rushing to reply, take a moment to consider the other person's statement. Ask follow-up questions to better understand what the speaker intended. Try to understand their emotional state and the deeper motivations behind their statement. What life experiences led them to their current worldview? Remember, you don't need to share someone's opinion in order to understand it and acknowledge it. And listening will help inform and expand your own opinion. Open up. Learning more about other people's experiences is a key element to seeing the world through someone else's eyes. But it is also important to open up about your own feelings and experiences. Empathy is a two-way street that at best is built upon mutual understanding. Through a combination of uncovering the deeper motivations of someone else's position and expressing our own underlying concerns, we often discover a shared commonality, even with those who hold different beliefs than ours. Through the practice of keeping an open mind, empathy helps us challenge prejudice, find commonality, and expand our moral universe. Without it, we are apt to label people outside our circle as the other, the problem, or the enemy. These labels draw lines in the sand that prevent us from moving forward or growing. It cuts us off from the realization that the human experience is a shared experience. We have much more in common than we think and are really just seeing small variations of the same reality. One of the things that my wife and I did when we were in Europe, in Luxembourg, was to become quite involved with the United States military. I had an opportunity to spend a week in Afghanistan, where I went to every different part of Afghanistan and met with some of the troops and met with some of the, I stayed with the, I stayed with the Marine base on the Pakistani border, which was where uh, ultimately they found uh, Osama, this one Osama bin Laden was living. But Julie and I became very passionate about helping uh, members of the military. Julie, my wife Julie, by the way, is up there, and, and I couldn't have done this without her. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that happened to us was that there was, when something was going on in Luxembourg where the military was involved, we would always kind of pitch in. There was 150 bike riders one day that were all wounded warriors who were coming through Luxembourg on a tour through uh, Europe. And so what we did was we hosted a barbecue for them. Imagine that, 150 people coming over to our house for a barbecue. It wasn't quite a small, it wasn't a very small house, but it was outside, actually. 
Um, and four or five of the guys were just really nice, really nice people, uh, very curious. And so I thought to myself, why not just bring them up to the office and talk to them for a few minutes? So five guys came up with me to, to the office, which is a big deal. The, the uh, ambassador's office is a pretty fancy place in terms of mystique, if nothing else. Um, and I went around and talked to them all and found out what they were about and who they were and kind of what they did. And <clears throat> came across this one guy whose name was Sal Junta. And Sal Junta was just this kind of average sized, nice fellow. And I said to him, so what do you do, Sal? And he said, well, I work for the Washington Speakers Bureau. And I said, wow, okay. And so I went on to the next guy. Who was, the, who was working in an engineering department. <clears throat> and I came back and I started thinking about Sal. And when I was listening to Sal talk about wounded warriors, I, I heard something that I didn't really hear in any of the rest of them, which was a sense of responsibility for other people that were unlike everybody else's responsibility. The military is a terrific organization. And, and quite frankly, it's an, it's, an, it's an organization which most people really enjoy because Everyone has everybody else's back. Well, Sal, when he said what he did, I said, huh, what is the, what is the, uh, uh, why do you speak, why do you work for the Washington Speakers Bureau? He said, well, to tell you the truth, um, I was, uh, I won this award. And I said, really, what kind of award did you win? He said, well, I won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And in finding out what he did, he was the first American in Afghanistan to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. And he won it because he saved personally the lives of 14 men. He did that. And it was amazing because I would have never picked that up if I really wasn't actively listening to what the folks were talking about around me. He, learned, he talked about bravery and in terms of, he said, you know, he, was, he had no sense of entitlement, no sense of, uh, of what he did was so spectacular. Um, he was very humble, and he thought really nothing of his valor, telling me anybody would have done the same thing. I knew that wasn't true. But in terms of listening to him and understanding what he was saying, it, it, it benefited me so much to learn about somebody else who I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, and I only figured out who he was and what he was all about by listening very, very carefully. Empathy is the, admit, the uh, ability to recognize the emotional experience of someone else and recall your own similar experiences and respond with sympathy and understanding. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment. Not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. 
we're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Talk about empathy. Empathy is something that is from within. Empathy is something that makes you understand someone else from your heart, not from your mind, not from a book, not from what someone else tells you about that person. And I have to share another experience with you that I had with the, with the Marines, actually. The, the Semper Fi Fund, which is a Marine fund that helps Marines that, that have been injured, brought seven Marines to our house, and actually one member, one Air, Army Ranger from the 82nd Airborne. He had lost two arms and a leg, that guy. But the rest of them had lost at least one arm or one leg and had a prosthesis, meaning they had a, 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 a device which helped them walk or helped them use their arm and has a hook on it those kinds of things. And when that happened, when they, they asked me whether I could, they could come, it was, it was really kind of an interesting experience. Because what happened was, um, one of the Marines was, that was there was really unhappy. I mean, it was very clear to me that he was just terribly unhappy. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want me to talk to him. And it was the best speech, probably, that I've ever given in my life. But it was the best speech that I could conceivably come up with that night. And it was a speech from my heart that talked about courage, that talked about why someone who was obviously um, unhappy had the courage and the commitment to do what they did without knowing any of the consequences. I had no idea how I would have reacted to that kind of um, adversity. But I, I talked for about 10 minutes on my inadequacy of being able to really understand what happened to this guy and why he was so mad and why, why he, he was just, you could just feel it. I mean, it was, it was kind of in the air. So after the 10 minutes, the guy walked up to me and he said, I had absolutely no desire to come to, your res to the ambassador's residence tonight and hear another politician pity me. But you actually understood my trials and my tribulations. Thank you. I really appreciated it. And he gave me a hug. Now, for a Marine, the Marine to give you a hug is a big deal. But the fact that the empathy that I displayed that night, which didn't come from somebody, I didn't ever learn that. No one ever said, hey, this is what you're supposed to do when you see that. But it gave me an opportunity to make someone else's life better in a very significant way. And it didn't, and it, um, and it gave me the connection that otherwise I would have never had. So empathy is a really important part of leadership. Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's gonna be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? 
I had a whole trip planned for us. Hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness. It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. Give you a better example, probably, of the listening skills and the empathetic skills in that one. Talk about authenticity. Based on my work and my research, I define authenticity as the consistent practice of choosing to know who you are, to embrace who you are, and be who you are as much as possible. But what does that actually really mean? What it means is that, first of all, the act of being who we are and revealing who we are at our core as much as possible, it's a practice and it's a journey. It's something that we do minute to minute, moment to moment, person to person. We do this even though we fear that judgment and bias is going to come our way, which it will, but even in the face of that, we still say courageously, I'm still gonna do me and put me out into the world because when I do this, I feel best about myself. But in order to make this happen, in order to live an authentic life or live in alignment with what I call the authenticity principle, which is the title of my book, but more importantly, it's a way of life, is that we work on knowing who we are. So if I were to say to someone like, who are you? What would you say? Advice that people give us all the time, be yourself. So we hear the advice, be yourself all the time, but that actually is meaningless when we know that first of all, judgment and bias is coming our way, which is what causes so many of us to push down our identities, push down who we are, tie back, for example, to our gender identity, our race, ethnoculture, our sexual orientation, our personality, our hobbies, our pastimes, our political beliefs and more. It's about how, despite the fear of judgment and bias coming our way, can we stand in our power? Can we feel good in our own skin? Can we embrace who we are and then reveal that to people in a vulnerable way without feeling shame? And in fact, feeling really good about who we are. And so that's what authenticity really is about. It's about despite feeling fear and judgment, we courageously reveal who we are at our core as much as possible. So, authenticity is something that's very hard to obtain without having some experiences that gave you the confidence to be authentic. Just after I had come into the business of building houses, after being a laborer in the field for 14 months, um, I was given the task of going to a county commission meeting and getting the county commission to put a, a turnpike exchange right in the middle of our property. And it was real important, obviously, to, uh, to, the, to my dad and his two partners to have that occur. Um, it meant a lot of money, it meant a lot of prestige, had all kinds of implications to it, and they sent me to go do that, as opposed to going themselves. So I go to this meeting, and at the meeting, the chairman of the county commission says to me, hey, Bobby, now you're willing to give the property and give it for, it for free to us if we build this interchange for you. And I thought about it for a second, and I said to myself, well, you know, this is going to enrich the entire piece of property, so 60 acres is not a lot of property in terms of the 2,000 acres that we own. So I said, sure, we'll be glad to give it to you. And they went along and they actually voted that night 
to recommend to put the interchange there. Well, next morning I go into a meeting with my dad and his two partners, and I say, good news, um, we uh, got the opportunity to give the, to have an interchange there, but oh, by the way, I also agree that we were gonna give them the property. <clears throat> and one of my dad's partners named John completely exploded. It was the wild, I mean, it was almost as if I gave it away his children. He said, it's not your property. Why are you giving it away? How did you think that you could give our property away? On and on and on and on. His other partner, Jimmy, who was also a person who I, I knew, obviously, all these people real well, said, you know, John, when we send Bobby to do a job and we give him the opportunity to make decisions, even if he makes the wrong decisions, we've given him that opportunity and we need absolutely to support him in making that decision. Well, you have no idea what that did for me. It gave me the feeling that I was all powerful, that no matter what I did, as long as I did it with the right reasons involved, and making the right decisions for my, for my view of it, that I could do anything. And so the opportunity to become authentic at that point in time in the business world which I was in, knowing that my partners or my bosses uh, or whoever would support me was just the most incredible experience that I had in terms of becoming a person, becoming a businessman, becoming a leader. Because I knew that I could count on the people behind me supporting me. Now, the, ca the caveat is that you have to do the right thing for the right reasons. So if I had done the wrong thing for the wrong reasons, um, it probably wouldn't have worked out that way. If I had been taking some money, for example, from the guy who was making the decision uh, because I gave him the land, that would have been the wrong, wrong decision. That would have, I would have been doing something for the wrong reason. But as long as I was doing it for the right reason, they, they support, he supported me, and the other guy finally supported me, and it gave me the confidence that I could be a leader and be authentic about it. When I teach, one of the things that, that uh, Zach didn't tell you was that my job today is that I teach all new ambassadors how to be ambassadors. So I've now trained 79 ambassadors in, the, uh, in their opportunity to become ambassadors. They're all ambassadors all over the world now. And I now mentor them um, from Washington. But it, I tell all of them that they need to make sure they tell their staffs that they get supported. If they make a bad decision because it was the right for them, it was the right decision for the right reasons. They need to be supported, even if they make a mistake. And that's how I ran my company. And that's how people should run their embassies. And that's a, that's a way that you can feel like people believe you're authentic. You feel supported. Based on my work and my research, I define authenticity as the consistent practice
Bill Deck found, found that one, and he was absolutely right. Great, great dude. Determination is something that's not, as you can see, it's not easy. It's not artificial. Um, it's somebody doing what they really want to do and making sure that they do whatever it takes to get there. When I was a young, so uh, one of the things that I did in my life was I was the chairman of the Florida Department of Environment. And as a real estate guy and a builder, I was skeptically looked upon by a great number of folks in the state. But I recognized that my job was one of making sure that my children and my children's children and their children's children got something in an environment in Florida that was so critically important. And the environment <coughs> It's probably, this is 20 years, 30 years later. It's really important today, as it just as it was then. But the skepticism which I was looked on, initially anyway, um, was, oh my God, he's just going to sell out. What I tried to figure out was how to get to the other side of that. And I had a really interesting conversation one night with a guy named Carlos Alvarez. Carlos Alvarez was, <coughs> in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the most successful wide receiver that had ever played football at the University of Florida or in the, in the United States. He was a remarkable split end. And he said to me one day, he said, well, I said, how come you were so successful, Carlos? He said, well, he said, the truth of the matter is that I visualized everything. I said, what does that mean? He said, when the play was called in the huddle, he said, I visualized walking all the way to my spot getting in the position that I was supposed to get in, running the pattern I was supposed to run, watching the defensive guy come near me, watching the football come to me, and he said, and I watched that football as it hit my hand. That was all before anybody even gone on the, the ball of the night. He caught 96% of the passes that were, set, that, was, that were thrown to him, which is kind of hard to believe, but, but he was incredible. So the concept of visualization, is how, from that point on, I've done a good bit of my life. I visualized my way through to the other end. When I was nominated to become an ambassador, I had to get approved by the United States Senate. And the Senate at the time had um, as many Republicans as it did Democrats. So I had to get them to agree with what I needed to do, which means confirm me to become an ambassador. And it was a really interesting process, but I visualized it. I saw how it could work. I made every effort that I could to follow that path. And of course, ultimately, it worked out just fine. And I had a great opportunity to do that. But the determination it took to do that started with visualizing a successful result. And I think that part of what you'll find out um, is how just really important the determination that you have will cause you to be a leader where people, where, that people will follow. I mean, the, the, truth, the true fact of being a leader is that people follow you. And you'll be able to do that. It's an exciting time and it's an exciting opportunity. It, it requires integrity. It requires honesty. Because if you're honest with other people, they'll be honest with you, generally speaking. Um, the other thing that involves to me that's so important is gratitude. Be grateful for the things that you have and to recognize that your obligation, if in fact you have something that's been handed to you, whether you earned it or you got it or if it was given to you, is to give back. Give back to your community, give back to your religion, give back to the things that are important to you that make society successful. I think that is probably one of the most important things that you'll learn uh, as you go along. I've never given anything with any expectation of return, and yet I've generally been given 10 times more than I ever expected. So. In one experiment, participants were put in groups of three in small rooms to discuss a complex moral problem. And one person in each group was randomly designated the team leader. Half an hour later, the experimenter came by with four cookies for each team. So who got the extra cookie? In each case, it went to the team leader. Even though they had no special aptitude, they didn't have extra responsibilities, and they'd gotten their position through chance alone. Once you have achieved a certain status, it seems natural to feel like you deserve it, and all the other good things that come your way. 
Now this is just an anecdote, but whenever I've been upgraded to fly business class, I've always observed the worst behavior in my fellow privileged passengers. They just act so entitled and uncourteous. And research has found evidence for this as well. In another experiment, participants were asked to think of a good thing that happened to them recently. And then one group was asked to list their own personal qualities or actions that made that good thing happen. Another group was asked to list external factors beyond their control that led to the event. And a control group was simply asked to list reasons why the good thing happened. Now, for completing this task, participants were told they would be paid a dollar. But at the end, they were offered the option to donate some or all of the money to a charity. Results showed those who listed their own personal attributes contributed 25% less than those who listed external factors beyond their control. Now, think of what all this means for people in our society, specifically for people in positions of power, like business leaders and politicians. Now, undoubtedly, most of them are talented and hardworking, but they have also been luckier than most. And like most of us, they don't realize just how lucky they are. And this gives them a distorted view of reality. They're kind of living in a form of survivor bias. All these leaders have worked hard and ultimately succeeded, so to them the world appears fair. In their experience, it rewards hard work. But what they don't have is the experience of all the people who have worked hard and failed. So what are they to make of people less successful than themselves? Well, the natural conclusion is that they must just be less talented or less hardworking. And this perspective makes them less inclined to be generous, to give back. And they are the ones who set the rules for how society operates. And this is particularly unfortunate since one of the main ways many of us are lucky is in our country of residence. But what is a country except for the things put there by people who came before? The roads and the schools, public transport, emergency services, clean air and water, every, everything like that. It seems a cruel trick of our psychology that successful people without any malice will credit their success largely to their own hard work and ingenuity and therefore contribute less to maintaining the very circumstances that made that success possible in the first place. The good news is that acknowledging our fortunate circumstances not only brings us more in line with reality, it also makes us more likable. In a study where people had to read the transcript of a fictional 60 Minutes interview with a biotech entrepreneur, experimenters tried changing just the last paragraph where the interviewee is talking about the reasons for their company's success. In one version, the entrepreneur personally takes credit for the success they've had, but in the other, he says luck played a significant role. Now, people who read the luck version of the transcript judged the entrepreneur as kinder and thought they'd be more likely to be close friends with him than those who read the other version of the transcript. And raising our awareness of fortunate events can also make us happier because it allows us to feel gratitude. And having an attitude of gratitude is the most important thing you can do. Two quick last thoughts. Number one, Albert Einstein said something which always intrigued me. He said, I have no special talents, I'm just passionately curious. And I can tell you that my life has been based upon curiosity, because I think it's really been helpful to me. And lastly, President Obama said to one of um, my kids, dream big dreams. And that's what I would encourage all of you to do, is dream big dreams. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it.